Exhibit 7. Cabinet removes quarantine requirement for fully vaccinated returning nationals and residents. Government says there will be weekly tests for unvaccinated cruise tourism stakeholders. Police commissioner concerned about youth involvement in crime. And Parliament's lower house passes legislation to make the country more attractive to foreign direct investment. The details right now. The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for the evening news here on ABS, the Tigas News Authority. My name is Garfield Burford. And I'm Sequoia Servia. Thank you for joining us. As of tomorrow, returning nationals and residents who have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and arrived with a negative PCR test will not be tested at the airport or asked to quarantine. Well, it will, however, be a very different situation for returning residents and nationals who are unvaccinated. ABC's Ursula Charles Jr. has the latest on government's decisions on the issue. Beginning Friday this week, vaccinated returning nationals and residents will no longer need to be tested upon arrival at the airport. We can relax further the regime at the airport where persons are coming back to these islands, um, either as residents returning nationals or even to do business um, within the population, and you have a completed dose of, of vaccines, um, then there will be no need for a secondary test, a second test at the airport. The decision was taken by Cabinet at its weekly meeting on Wednesday, and it follows that each traveller must have negative results from a PCR test taken no more than seven days prior to travel. Information Minister the Honourable Melford Nicholas says people in this category will also be allowed to proceed to their homes unimpeded. With the PCR tests plus the vaccines, there's going to be no further reason for them to have another test at the airport, nor for any quarantine. So they'll be allowed to go straight into uh, the population. Only approved taxis are still allowed to transport people from VC Bird International. On the contrary, travelers who are unvaccinated will be compelled to quarantine for the full 14-day period at the government's quarantine facility, the Jolly Beach Resort. And it's not a prosecution. It is the reality that uh, there is a higher level of risk associated with persons who have not uh, been vaccinated and they have a higher ability to transmit um, the virus when they become infected. And so accordingly, uh, we have to treat with that risk in the appropriate manner. And the quarantine and isolation are the best known examples and we have done it over the last 15 months. So it is proven science. At a cost of approximately 82 EC dollars per day, this amounts to almost 1150 EC dollars per person. For ABS News, I'm Ursula Charles Jr. Thanks, Ursula. So meanwhile, Cabinet has taken a decision which will impact on unvaccinated tourism workers who ply their trade at the nation's cruise ports. Here again, Ursula Charles Jr. on the new arrangement approved by Cabinet on Wednesday. Get vaccinated or submit to weekly rapid tests for COVID-19 at your own expense. Well, that's the government's latest decision ahead of the imminent reopening of the cruise industry on July 20. The decision applies to all hospitality and tourism workers who ply their trade at the nation's cruise ports. The government has taken the decision that for those persons who are still unvaccinated, they are going to be required to have a weekly test. And in this instance, we will afford them the use of the uh, rapid tests. So the Ministry of Health will be available, but the cost will be to them. According to Minister Nicholas, these new stipulations stem from the troubling issue of vaccine hesitancy. Amongst the uh, vendors who are selling in the Vendors Mall, uh, the president of the Vendors Association indicated that they're working with a number of approximately 72%. Uh, even the shops in Heritage Key and Redcliffe Key, the president of the Merchants Association in the Keys have indicated that they're looking at approximately 72% of the persons who are uh, vaccinated and there is a degree of hesitancy still in some of the worker population. Even the two operators have indicated that it is approximately 60% of uh, their staff. Added to this, the minister notes only 55% of taxi drivers have reportedly been vaccinated. The latest pronouncement follows decisions made by officials within the Florida Caribbean Cruise Association that unvaccinated cruisers cannot be barred from embarking on cruises of their choosing. 
As a result, we must do everything on the ground to protect ourselves. A risk to themselves and a risk to the general population. If when they become exposed to persons who are unvaccinated, uh, the, there is increased potential for them to be able to uh, become infected with any uh, new COVID strain or any of the current strains um, that would come unsure with the reopening of the sector. The information minister has also advised any unvaccinated excursionist will be mandated to take a rapid test before disembarking at the ports. What we're doing, we're putting up an additional veil by asking the cruise lines to work with us to ensure that those persons who they would know are unvaccinated will then be required to undergo a, a rapid test before they alight. Measures firmly in place to protect both guests and host. For ABS News, I'm Ursula Charles Jr. Active cases of COVID-19 have risen to two, with one new case being recorded in this country as of 6 p.m. yesterday. 99 samples were processed at the Sir Lester Bird Mount St. John's Medical Center, yielding one new infection. One of the two active cases is in hospital with moderate symptoms. The country's overall COVID-19 tally now stands at 1,266. Meanwhile, 36,826 people have availed themselves of their first dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. 28,251 people have gone on to receive their second dose. More news emerging now from the cabinet yesterday because the date has been confirmed for the first FET. Officials are marking it or making it clear, however, all approved FETs will have strict protocols to help decrease the possibility of transmission of COVID-19. Here's more on this story from ABS's Shana Keisha Francis. Cabinet has announced the first authorized FET on the season's calendar will take place on Sunday, July 18, 2021 at the Coolidge Cricket Grounds with a maximum attendance of 300 fully vaccinated patrons. Cabinet has highlighted based on the risk of a spike in COVID-19 cases, the FET will be subjected to strict protocols. Minister for Information, the Honorable Melford Nicholas, spoke about one of the main requirements to which patrons will need to adhere. Getting home by three is an indication that we have created a window and an opportunity for us to get back to a degree of normalcy and that we have contained it within that particular time frame. Notwithstanding, Minister Nicholas says police should be tolerant to patrons who have their FET stubs on hand. The police will be tolerant if you have those particular circumstances. Your car was in a difficult parking area, but the fact is that you would have the insignia of your attendance at the event and you're trying to get home and we want you to get home safely. Events must end by 2.30 a.m. and patrons must keep proof of ticket purchase and wristbands in case they are stopped by police on their way home after the event. All patrons must arrive home before 3 a.m. Cabinet says a full epidemiological study will be conducted after the first event to determine if anyone has become infected. Subsequent FETs will only be permitted to proceed once the first FET is proven to have been safe. Officials say this is because Science indicates spikes in infections follow mass gatherings. Shana Keisha Francis for ABS News. Thanks so much, Shana Keisha. And we can get more on this story this evening because we can now get the very latest on the upcoming FET, which will be the first, as we said, since March of last year, when, of course, lockdown took effect. And it is a major developing story this evening. Cabinet says the event will take place under very strict protocols at the Coolidge Cricket Grounds. Well, joining us is Jaime, is Jaime Hunt, who is the interim board member for the Promoters Association, the group staging the event. Uh, Jaime, thank you so much for joining us this evening. So let's t talk about this. Uh, 300 uh, patrons for this event. Have all 300 patrons purchased their tickets, tickets yet? And is all in place for the event? Good evening, Mr. Bluford. But um, all tickets are on sale from this Saturday. So I know a lot of people have been asking us when do tickets go on sale? When do tickets go on sale? They go on sale from this Saturday at midday on the ticketing app. So you can be one of the lucky persons, one of the lucky 300 persons that can purchase your tickets this Saturday at midday on the ticketing app. Okay, thank you so much. So how did you check the authenticity of the vaccination information provided? How, how, is, how are they gonna check that authenticity coming up on Saturday? Ticketing will be creating a portal when you purchase a ticket and it will be verified as well when you get to the venue. So there'll be a two-tier verification system. 
Okay. All right, very good on that. And in terms of safety at the actual event, how will you ensure that in terms of ensuring that there's no tra zero transmission, despite the fact that they are fully vaccinated individuals? We're ensuring that we have hand washing stations, we have sanitizers, we're encouraging our patients to wear their masks as much as possible when not eating or drinking, and to ensure that, you know, if you're feeling ill, you're feeling any kind of sickness or any kind of symptoms, just stay home. And we, we, we're going to have technicians from the EMS and doctors on hand from the, from the Ministry of Health to ensure that everyone is safe. And even though it's a fun atmosphere, it's the first event, so everyone is excited for the restart of the entertainment, entertainment industry. We're ensuring that this first event is a safe event. And our final question to you tonight, DJ Jaim. The Cabinet says there will be an epidemiological study after the event. How will you work with the authorities on this specific? Well, we will work ta in tandem with the Ministry of Health with, with whatever they require from us. I think there's a two-week hiatus between the first event and the other events to ensure that there was no spread or any contact via that first event to ensure that events are, in fact, actually safe with fully vaccinated persons. So that's, that's what the two-week uh, period I think that they have in place is for. And after the two-week hiatus and there are no instances of spread or contacts, or uh, any uh, of the like, we will continue with our entertainment industry. And I'm pretty sure that everybody is happy to see entertainment back. DJ Chairman, one or two words as we wrap up. How are you feeling going into this event on Sunday? One or two words. I'm, I'm definitely feeling good. It's, it's great to actually be back to doing what I love to do and doing what, you know, what pays the bills. You know, it, it's really a great feeling to be back and restart in our entertainment industry. All right. Thank you so much, uh, DJ Jime. DJ Jime Hunt, interim board member for the Promoters Association. Really appreciate it, and we wish you all the best with the event on Sunday. Thanks, guys. No worries. Indeed. Well, let's continue with this developing story. Let's go on to the nation's legislature now because an amendment was passed in Parliament's lower house today to make the country more attractive to investors in special economic zones. ABS's Rakib Aparicio has details from Parliament. Economic zones generally are established to attract more foreign direct investments, and at the same time, even to provide opportunities for locals to create um, products that do not attract um, duties and taxes, products that are exportable. Prime Minister Honorable Gaston Brown, during his contribution to parliamentary debate on the Special Economic Zone Amendment Bill 2021, explains current legislation requires a parcel of land to meet the 1,235-acre threshold to be considered a special economic zone. This, he warns, is not attractive to foreign investors, nor does it encourage local participation. Yida is the only one that is licensed so far, and we want to broaden the um, participation in the special economic zone uh, infrastructure that we have developed. And uh, we are reducing the threshold down to 500, or as I said earlier, or any lesser acreage as determined by the cabinet. The bill led to two hours of intense debate. Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Jamal Pringle, argues too little is being done for local businesses to flourish. We, the small business in this country, must carry the weight for 20 years while the investors sit back and make back some of their money and we, some of their monies and we don't get the opportunity as small businesses in Antigua and Barbuda. It's time enough we change the model. Representative for St. John's Rural North and Investment Minister, the Honorable Charles Fernandez, provides a swift rebuttal. Mr. Speaker, we have the, small, the entrepreneurial fund for the small business people. Up to yesterday in cabinet, one of them came in, an application came in, and several have been coming in. So this idea that we don't do anything for small business is, is ridiculous. Member of Parliament for St. Mary's North, Honorable Sir Marwin Joseph, makes his case for special economic zones. Concession beneficiaries, he says, invest significantly into the country. When Stanford developed this problem and he left this country, as VC Bird advised this nation decades ago, you can't take them up and carry it away. If he either has to pick up and go away tomorrow, at least you have 100 million US dollars of infrastructure that Antigua can market and bring an investor in here. The bill was read a third time and passed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. 
The bill will now be brought to Parliament's upper house, the Senate. Rakib Aparicio reporting for ABS News. Thanks, Rakib. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Brown chided opposition leader Honorable Jamal Pringle for suggesting the amendment was to benefit the EDA development. Prime Minister Brown sought to set the record straight today. I have said, Mr. Speaker, that the threshold, which is currently set at 1,335 acres, is too high. As a consequence, Yida has ended up with a virtual monopoly because we are unable to get another tract of land that size to designate as a special economic zone. It means that Yida would end up with a virtual monopoly. So this amendment is no way in, in, in no way beneficial to Yida. If anything, it is removing any capacity for Yida to perhaps inadvertently enjoy a monopoly in this particular sector. And the Prime Minister also provided an update on the investment being bankrolled by Yida Zhang. It is the only business licensed so far under the Special Economic Zones legislation. He said there has so far been an investment of over 200 million US dollars and that has contributed significantly to the 7.4% real GDP growth the country enjoyed in 2018. There are some who have argued, and rightfully so, that Yida has not realized its full potential as yet. And that's a fact. But notwithstanding the fact that it has not achieved its full potential, it is still one of the largest investments that this country has seen to date. There are only perhaps maybe about two other investments to date that are larger than the Yida investment. So for example, you have PLH, which is probably in power presently, and you have Jolly Harbor. Members of Parliament played glowing tributes to former parliamentarian and former opposition leader Sir Eric Barton. Sir Eric died last month at the age of 90. He was Barbuda's parliamentary representative from 1980 to 1989. Lawmakers also extended condolences to his family. Sir Eric was the standard bearer at the time and being the lone person elected uh, outside of the government representatives. Um, he served as the leader of the opposition. So VC called the election early after four years in 1980. And Sir Eric was the first and founding member of the Barbuda People's Movement, won that election overwhelmingly in 1980. I remembered personally that when I used to go to Barbuda, Sir Eric used to come and pick me up and take me around. Sir Eric never turned down any investment going to Barbuda. Glowing tribute there for Sir Eric Burton. Now a startling revelation this evening about individuals as young as 14 engaging in criminal activities. Police Commissioner Atlee Rodney provided the update during an interview on Antigua Barbuda today. Kim Emanuel Beard recaps his comments. Police Commissioner Atlee Rodney says incidents of larceny and break-ins account for up to 75% of crimes committed during the first six months of 2021. He reveals a cause for concern that younger people are perpetrating these crimes. And the ages 14, 17, 23, which now tells you there is another trend of the type of persons who are committing these heinous crimes that we would normally associate with, you know, grown and kind of cultured type of criminals. He says this could be the result of neglect within the home, which causes them to engage in deviant behavior. To combat the increase in crime, the commissioner explained the necessity for intensified community policing. The police chief also reaffirms the efforts to increase the visibility of law enforcers across the country. What we have been doing in recent time is to put more effort into it so that persons can feel reassured that we are out there with them. Yes, we've been having a lot of police maybe in plain clothes doing undercover work and assessing what is happening around us, but I think persons wouldn't be aware of that. And Apart from increase in police patrols, Commissioner Rodney also says surveillance cameras are crucial in assisting in investigations. This is Kim Emanuel Baird reporting for ABS News. Another busy news evening. Stay with us for more of the national developments we are working on this evening, including this one. We continue to help you stay alert this hurricane season. Jamie Roche will tell you about keeping your animals safe.
You don't want to miss Jamie's Stay Alert feature. And later on, proud achievement for a 28-year-old in Tegan who has earned his PhD. He talks with us about his research. Upcoming on the ABC Evening News, on air and online. Do stay with us, please. At Nagico, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like knowing you're covered when your house gets flooded. Getting your settlements quickly and fairly when a fire hits your home and making sure your business can keep going even after an accident happens on site. At Nagico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. Danserve is committed to keeping Antigua and Barbuda safe with our mass sanitization program. Our methods are safe, effective, and efficient, and eliminate pathogens, mold, bacteria, and viruses, especially COVID-19. We are introducing the EPA-approved Victory Innovations Electrostatic Sprayer and Vital Oxide Disinfecting Sanitizer. Our solution is even safe to use around children. It's odorless, easy to use, and will disinfect areas and surfaces for up to five to seven days, depending on application. The electrostatic sprayer atomizes the molecules of the vital oxide to adhere itself to all surfaces. It's much more effective than wiping. We are committed to using the most advanced sanitization methods for the safety and health of everyone. For the cleanest clean, contact JanServe today. JanServe is a service mark of the Akima Group Incorporated. Seeing is experiential. Seeing is everyday life. Seeing is style, class, and sheer sophistication. At iMobile Vision Care, we offer state-of-the-art lab technology and the widest variety of quality eyewear from the biggest brands to suit your lifestyle. Stop by our offices at Dr. Rosalie Drive Lower Gambles to get a comprehensive digital eye exam or call us at 562-7823 and ask about our optical care services. Mobile Vision Care. See and be seen. What does it mean to be original? It's more than doing something first. It's doing something that's never been done and doing it again and again. It's Valvoline, introducing motor oil to the world, then improving it relentlessly, inventing racing oil, high mileage oil, and the synthetic blend. Valvoline, the original oil. Automotive art is the place to start. We are the official distributors of Valvoline. Snacks, juices, and household supplies. When you shop at KL Distributors, we promise affordable prices and variety like you've never seen. Have fun with our three for five snack pack. You mix and match popcorn, Cheetos, Doritos, enough for the kids during these long summer days. We also carry a variety of cereals, granola bars, and healthy snacks. Juices and sodas, we've got it all. Sunny D and Capri Sun for the kids. Ocean Spray, Tropicana, Canada Dry, and Iced Tea. Pick up your favorite household items. Supplies such as laundry detergent and fragrance boosters and other cleaning agents. Free island-wide delivery on orders over $60. We're K&L Distributors and Supplies, St. George Walter Highway, Utopia Park Complex, adjacent Mr. Terminator Car Wash. Now this is going out to my Tessie crew Cause I ain't got nothing but love for you You wanna go for a session when no one can see When you follow on from me, you 
get one free. It's another big, big buy one get one free sale at Cool and Smooth on selected shoes, clothing, children wear, kids shoes. Then look out for our new arrival of shoes with 20% off. Jordan sneakers and New Balance going as low as $250. Then stroll over to our appliance section because we're giving you 20% off appliances and furniture plus 10% off and more on kitchen utensils. So if you're looking for a deal, then look for Cool and Smooth on Lower Market Street. You want to need a good life that you see in your dreams. When you buy one for me, you get one for you. Welcome out. The Antigua Public Utilities Authority says increased reverse osmosis plant capacity will rectify the water supply problem within a year. That's the assurance from the entity's general manager, Esworth Martin, as he spoke on the recent launch of the entity's fiber optic broadband service. Next year, this time, switching to water, we should be commissioning a $3 million building our plant at Bethesda. A $5,000 per day arrow plant to be started at Fort James is on the seas on its way to Antigua. Martin says the current reverse osmosis plant will also be able to produce more water. The price capacity improvement of $400,000 per day is a work in progress as we speak as well. Folks, what I have just declared is by next year June, July, no later, if you will have installed capacity to supply 11.6 million gallons of portable water daily. The general manager says the current demand is 7.6 million gallons per day, which APOA will be able to meet even in the dry season. We'll have a 100% hour solution. Even during the times of drought, when there's no rain, we'll be able to supply portable water 24-7. As promised, we continue our Stay Alert series this evening with a closer look now at what you need to know about protecting your pets and other animals if a storm threatens. Jamie J. Roche has the latest. As you fine tune your storm preparedness strategy this hurricane season, be sure to include your animals in the planning. For instance, what would happen to your pets or livestock if you must seek refuge at a public shelter. As I hinted in part one of this feature, authorities won't permit animals at the shelters for health and safety reasons. People are there, you don't know who has allergies, etc., and so on, and it's um, a relatively confined area. So what arrangements can you make? If you have cats or dogs, you could board them at a facility like Pioneer Kennel and Veterinary Clinic in Vendors. Our facility holds approximately 30 dogs, and about 25 cats. Veterinarian Dr. Radcliffe Robbins has over 30 years of experience. So animals boarded at the facility have constant access to veterinary care. He says the kennel, which has been in Bendels since 1994, is a safe shelter for the animals. This property is built to a very high level of hurricane resistance. And we have not had ever you know, any major hurricane damage for the storms that have passed since its construction. Dr. Robin says people should call ahead to make sure they space before bringing their cats. There is a separated area that the cat, if it needs privacy, can go in and chill and relax. And there's another area in it where the cat can lounge, climb up and lounge and rest. And in this way also, we're able to separate its toileting from its eating. Dog owners must prepare a bit more before boarding their pets. Because we house a number of animals in this facility, they should come in already vaccinated. Dr. Robin says owners should vaccinate their dogs about five to seven days before bringing them to the kennel. The vaccine will protect the animals from diseases like canine parvovirus and leptospirosis. Now, if you choose not to board your pet at a facility, what are your options? Some people say survival instincts will kick in if you set them free and they'll be safe. Dr. Robbins disagrees. I do not wish to own a dog that in the event of a hurricane, I'm going to let it go and expose it to 75 to 100 miles per hour wind to not be able to find shelter, to be exposed to flying galvanized and two by fours. 
it is it is not the kind thing to do he recommends teaching your dog how to behave in the house and take it in during the storm meanwhile the veterinarian says owners should take livestock to high ground during storms he says they should brand their livestock and remove neck ropes and chains so they don't get trapped in trees and shrubs dr robin says owning animals is an enormous responsibility and people should plan to keep them safe I am Jamie J. Roche, and remember, if you don't want your animals to get hurt, it's up to you to stay alert. Good work, Jamie, and you've certainly made a good friend there, it seems. Well, the drive to cut carbon emissions has shifted into new gear this evening, literally. The Department of Environment, in conjunction with the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, has officially launched phase two of its sustainable low emissions mobility project. And this is Courtney Joseph explains. The aim of the sustainable low emissions mobility project is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Antigua and Barbuda by promoting the use of electric transportation. This country is now the first to start project implementation in this field. Last year, the initial launch of the project saw the installment of two electric buses into the school bus fleet in Antigua and Barbuda. Project coordinator Melissa LeBlanc further explains how this launch expands on that initiative. Next step, so what we're trying to do is we're going to procure, at, and I say at least, so hopefully more, at least two electric buses to be integrated into the, the bus fleet. We're doing this in partnership and uh, agreement with the bus association and also uh, at least two electric taxis for the airport's taxi fleet. She says the decision to buy electric buses and taxis is also a strategy to train the public to become familiar with electric transportation. Something that is so novel and so new. Wanted to be like, oh yeah, well, you know, I, I use this taxi, I was in this bus, I think it was electric, and everybody can have, um, can, t can get their own information about it and come to their own opinion on, on how they want to, to move forward. Once electric vehicles are distributed, LeBlanc says research will be conducted to determine the way forward. Okay, so that is going to be our pilot project where we get all our data, see how things work, you know, get feedback from, from the drivers, from the passengers. And from there, we are going to be um, inserting a financing window into our Sustainable Island Resource Framework Fund. Uh, it's about, going to be approximately 650000 US dollars. The project hopes to achieve 100% use of electric transportation within the country by 2040 to 2045. Its estimated cost is 3 million US dollars from the Global Environment Facility and 9.7 million in co-financing. Courtney Joseph, ABS News. Visiting COP26 President Alex Sharma has paid a visit to Hurricane Ravage Barbuda to assess the rebuilding process. As Sharma looks forward to the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, central to his visit was the ecological state of the island. Barbuda Council officials and other locals were keen to boast of the attractions of the local frigatebird population and what would happen to the earning power of the islanders if that and lobster populations decline. Sharma has wrapped up his two-day visit to the country to hold discussions with officials and representatives of local non-governmental organizations which are focused on the environment. COP26 begins in November later this year in Glasgow, Scotland. Well, the medical field will gain more expertise in the area of research in reproduction. And Tegan Joshua Burton has earned his Doctor of Philosophy or PhD in Biology and Research. He successfully defended his dissertation last Wednesday and spoke to ABS's Sherilyn Beezer. The 28-year-old is a scientist in the field of reproduction and development. Burton explains the biological significance arose from the prevalence of infertility, where about 13% of women of reproductive age have difficulty either getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to term. One of the common reproductive disorders that lead to infertility is known as primary ovarian insufficiency, and that actually affects 1% of women and is characterized by failure of the ovaries prior to the age of 40. He explains the significance of his work in this context, looking at the signaling mechanisms taking place at the cellular level in the ovary. Basically, the developmental mechanisms taking place that regulate how eggs initially develop and what factors determine what amount of them populate the ovary and then how 
how they proceed through the initial stages of their development. Burton shares his career goals. The plan is to apply for a postdoc position, so that would allow me to continue to do research and either diversify my skill set or further consolidate my technical expertise in the field that I'm already in. He will then determine whether to go into biotechnology or to stay in academia and pursue a faculty position. Burton says he initially intended to attend medical school, majoring in biology with an interest in clinical pathology. This all changed with encouragement from his professors to apply for research internships, and reproduction was the subject of the first internship. Burton went directly from undergraduate to pursue his PhD. Sherilyn Beza reporting for ABS News. Thanks, Sherilyn. Burton earned his PhD from Syracuse University. He had attended the Irene B. Williams and Antigua Grammar Schools before moving on to Antigua State College. Congratulations to him indeed. Uh, when we come back from this break, we'll turn our attention to news overseas. One of the stories that we're tracking very closely, of course, pertains to what took place in Haiti yesterday, uh, the tragic assassination of Haiti's President Jovenel Moïse. Well, suspects in that assassination are killed or arrested. We'll have an update. And internationally, Britain's military mission in Af Afghanistan comes to an end on the heels of the U.S. taking the same decision. Upcoming on the ABC Evening News, on air and online. Do stay with us, please.